All right, thanks, Justin. I teased Justin in the first service. I said, man, that's a great song, but I'm a little bur burned out on the white stuff after the blizzard of a couple weeks ago, right? I mean, it's kind of, we could figure a way to keep it off the streets, just on the yards. That would be, that would be fantastic. I don't know how, how we can do that. God can help us with that, I think. But uh, anyway, uh, we've got a lot going on Christmas Day. Hey, I'll be heading south on Christmas, so, you know, you can snow as much here as, you, as, as it wants to. I'll be, I'll be in Texas. But uh, anyway, well, it's great to be together. And God, God be praised, and I'm so glad that you're here. Again, if you're visiting with us for the first time, we really are honored that you uh, are our guest today. We pray that God speaks to you in a wonderful way. So on this wonderful second Sunday of, of the Christmas season, we're starting a new series called On the Way to the Manger, On the Way to the Manger. And, and what I'm hoping and what I'm praying can happen is that God will touch your heart in such a, a powerful way that, that this, this journey towards Christmas Day, this, this will be different for you. This, will be, this Christmas will be more of an impact. It will leave more of a lasting impact on, on you and your family and your outlook on life and your relationship with God than perhaps any other Christmas that you've experienced up until this point. And what I'm praying for you and your family, what I'm praying for me and my family is that by the time we get to December 26th, you would say, you know what, above all, Above all, greater than the, the, the presents, greater than all the dinners and the parties and the get-togethers, even greater than time with family and friends, greater than all of that, the greatest memories we made this year in this Christmas season were made because we intentionally sought Jesus and we put Him first in everything we did. Amen? Amen. Wouldn't that be great? You know, how, how great would it be that instead of letting others decide, e even others like well-intentioned family members, Instead of letting others decide what Christmas should be like for us, instead of being swept away by the winds of materialism, instead of believing the distorted lie that how much we spend on someone communicates our level of love for them. That's, that's terrible. Don't buy into that this year, okay? Instead of, being, instead of any of that, how, how about instead we, in the next 16 days or so leading up to Christmas, we, we make a commitment to go to the Lord, even daily, and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? Lord, what, 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 how can I serve you? How can I bring you honor? God, what, what's important to you this Christmas? What do you want to do in and through my life? God, how can we together as a church even, how can we show the love of our Savior who came down? How can we show that love so clearly to those that we encounter the next 16 days and beyond into 2019? How can we show that so clearly that it literally changes people's lives? Not, not just at Christmas time. But, but literally for, for all eternity. And, and you know something? If those are the kinds of questions you're committed to asking, let me just tell you this. You are in for an incredible, incredible Christmas. You really are because I'm telling you, our God is faithful and he's very eager to lead you to discover and experience the answers to those questions. But let me just say this in case anybody slipped into here who may be feeling like this. If already on this second Sunday of the, of the season of Advent that we call, Advent simply means coming. We're celebrating the coming of God into our world. We're looking forward to His second coming. But if already on this halfway, not even halfway through, you're already feeling a little bit frazzled, you're all feeling a little bit burned out and used up and stretched thin, let me just say, let me just say lovingly, I understand that, but you took a wrong turn somewhere. Okay, you took a wrong turn somewhere because that's not what all God has in mind for us. But here's the good news, okay? The good news is there's still time, right? There's still time to make a shift. There's still time to make a mid-course correction, to turn things around with God's help, to, to slow down. There's still time to get off the hamster wheel and, and to get your focus back. And I think if you would reach out to God today and you say, God, Help me. I may not have started this season great, but man, help me to finish strong. Help me to finish with my eyes on you. And I, I believe um, you, if you do that, reach out to God today. He will hear you. He'll respond, and you'll experience God doing incredible things in and through you. Again, not just at Christmas, but, but beyond into the new year. And so this Sunday, we're going to be working our way through the Christmas story. We don't have enough Sundays to get to every part of the Christmas story, but we're going to be picking and choosing. We're going to be looking at a few of the people who had the amazing privilege of being the first humans on earth to lay eyes on, on God in the flesh, Jesus. And we're asking God to help us this season, to Christmas 2018, to restore the joy and the wonder and amazement of that first Christmas. And we really need God to do that renewing work on our heart, right? Because we have heard this story so many times. We've heard it every year. We say, oh, 
Heard about that. I know all about that. Listen, we need God to, but God can make it fresh to you, can he? I believe he can. He can make it fresh and new and exciting and, and fill you up with the, the passion of knowing Christ on a deeper level. And this morning, we're going to look at the shepherds. We're going to start with the shepherds, okay? And, and the title of this message is On the Way to the Manger, Find Him. Find Him. That's what God wants for us. And the great thing about it, I know many of you have already found Him. You've already found Him. And what I mean by that is you have discovered the joy of personal salvation. You, you chose at a moment in time to, to call upon the name of Jesus, to forgive you of all your sins because you knew that it separated you from God. And you called upon Him. You put your trust in His finished work on the cross and in the hope of the resurrection. And right now you're experiencing the miracle of an authentic daily even moment by moment, relationship with God through the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and so I rejoice in that. But I, I want to make sure and add this very quickly. If you haven't found Him yet, if you don't know Him as your personal Lord and Savior, if you don't have the assurance of where you will spend all of eternity when you leave this earth, let me just encourage you, you could find that right now. You, you could find that as in here today before this service ends because guess what? Guess what the reality is? God is here. He is very present. His spirit is here, and he's calling out to you, and he's reaching out to you, and he's, he, he, you're here on purpose. If you don't know him, he's, he drew you here because he loves you, and he's drawing you to himself so that you might open up your heart to him. And if you would do that, I promise you, whoever you are, if you would do that, you will never, you will never regret it. And so turn with me this morning, if you're not already there, Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, and we're going to look at these examples of the shepherds because, wow, let me tell you, these guys understood something about finding in Jesus uh, the answers they were looking for, okay? And so uh, this morning, we're not going to read the whole story. Um, we'll get to that before we're, we're done with this Christmas season as a church family. But I just want to read a few verses from Luke 2. I'm going to begin in verse 8, okay? Verse 8. And so let me get it pulled up here myself. Here we go. The words are on the screen. If you didn't bring a Bible, we love for you to bring a Bible and follow along and and that is God's life book for you. It's his, it's his guidebook for you on this journey in life. So here we go. Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. And when the angel had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And so they hurried off, and we'll get to the rest of that in just a minute, but uh, they, they heard about it, they were amazed, and, and they, they ran off and said, let's, let me, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing, which the Lord has told us about. Just as, and it's amazing. It's an amazing story, and we've heard it before, but let God recapture your heart this, this morning. Let him speak to you as if you've heard this for maybe the first time, all right? So I want to jump in here, and I want to start with a few principles about how God finds us. Okay, I really need to start there. I said we were talking about us finding God, and the shepherds give us a good example of searching and finding, but you have to understand the reality that, that one of the important things we always need to remember in our Christian lives is that before we ever find God, listen carefully, before we ever find God, He finds us. Now, I know it doesn't seem that way because as we're searching before we come to know Christ in a personal way, we're empty and lost and our lives are in many respects dark and we're making and we're grasping and searching and trying to fill our lives and, and, it, and it seems like we're doing all the seeking. It seems like we're doing all the searching and it seems like we're taking most of the steps toward Him. And in some ways that is, but the reality is after you find Him, and you're truly saved and your eyes are open, you begin to realize and sometimes you actually even begin to see all the wonderful ways that God was seeking you and God was pursuing you and God was calling your name and, and God was arranging your circumstances and putting people in your path so you would be awakened to his great love for you. And Jesus himself says in John 6, no one can come to me 
unless the Father who sent me draws them. Okay? And so no one finds God unless God first finds them. We call this the grace that goes before. We, uh, a theological term is prevenient grace. It's the grace that came before we were even aware that God was searching for us. And again, maybe you're here this morning and you've begun to realize at some point, or maybe now even, your eyes are being opened to the fact that God is reaching out to you and He wants a personal relationship with you more than you can imagine. And maybe you realize that He's brought you here to this place. You, you may have gotten invited by a friend or you, you just saw the sign or you saw it on the website. You thought, hey, we'll go check it out. But if you don't know Him, I'm telling you, you're here on purpose this morning for, for, the, very, for the very serious reason to hear once again the miracle of how God, our God, the God who spoke all this into being, how He left the glory and the majesty of heaven and He come down to this earth in the person of Jesus So that you could know a love so great it could save you. A love so great that that it would keep you from spending eternity apart from Him when you leave this earth. And you could know this love for yourself and you could experience it all of your days until He calls you home. And so the question is, how how does God find us? How does God find us? Well, let's look at this amazing story. And we're going to learn something from the shepherds because I'm telling you, God found them. Okay? He found them first. Here's, how, here's the first thing about how God finds us, okay? He meets us right where we are. Write that down. If you're taking notes, it's on the screen. He meets us right where we are. Look at verse 8 again with me. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby. Where were they? Tell me, church. They were in the fields, that's right, and they were keeping watch over their flocks at night. So you had this group of shepherds, and they're not doing anything spectacular. They're just out there doing what shepherds do. They're just out there on the outskirts of Bethlehem. They're probably about two miles outside the city limits of this little uh, little village known as Bethlehem. In fact, I was reading this week that there's still a field to this very day. There's a field about two miles known as the shepherd's field. We don't know if that's exactly where this happened. There's several locations that claim to be the spot where this happened, but make no mistake, this did happen. Now, shepherds are mentioned everywhere in the Bible. You can't read the Word of God without encountering them and and bumping into them. Um, In the Old Testament, for example, Moses was a shepherd. If you remember the story later in Genesis about Joseph and the coat of many colors, Joseph and his brothers, they were shepherds. David, who would later become the greatest king of Israel, he he started out as a shepherd boy. But although the shepherds are, are spoken of relatively well in the Scriptures, they're kind of put in a fairly positive light. Let me tell you something. In the time of Jesus, in, in the day that Jesus came, the, 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 the shepherds did not have a great reputation at all. Today, they might be compared to groups, that, and, and, and this is not how we feel about them. You understand? We're not casting condemnation on these groups, but just our society tends to stereotype groups like gypsies and, 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 and carnies and, uh, and, and, you know, people just kind of move around and kind of transient and, and maybe, maybe like the cowboys of the, of the frontier days, they kind of roll into town and kind of tear the place up. That's kind of what shepherds were viewed of. They weren't really trustworthy. They were kind of outcasts, so to speak. They maybe is seen as going from place to place, never really putting anything down, roots and not being able to consistently provide for their family. They weren't looked upon very favorably in this day. And there's a whole lot more we can say about the shepherds. You can look it all up yourself. But I think that is enough of a glimpse to give us a very powerful picture of the kind of people that God is trying to reach. They desperately wants to have a relationship with. I mean, these guys in Luke 2, listen, these guys in Luke 2, they could even make the day shift. Hello? They're working the night shift as shepherds. I mean, they're kind of on the low rung of the ladder and, and uh, needless to say, a very tough, dirty, thankless, lonely job. But there they were. There they were on the outskirts of Bethlehem in the fields watching over their flocks. And God came after them in a big time way and he met them right where they are. And throughout Scripture, you cannot miss this. Listen, God loves everybody. He, wants, he doesn't want a single person on this planet to perish That is to spend eternity apart from him. But it seems like there's lots of evidence in the scripture that God's heart goes out to those people that are maybe considered to be outcast, the poor, the lonely, the least. And and so I, I want it to be said loud and clear this morning so there's no mistaking. Whoever you are this morning, no matter where you've been or what you've done, I, I, no matter how low you feel, no matter how troubled your past may have been, no matter what you estimate to be the worth of your future, let me just say this very clearly this morning so you'll never forget it again. God loves you tremendously. 
loves you more than you can imagine. And not only that, but let me say this, this church loves you too. You may be new here. You may be feeling like you don't belong. You're surrounded. Church, let them know. Let them know that you love them. You may not even know that. You say, well, you don't know us. Well, we don't have to know you to love you. We just love you because you're made in God's image, and he has a purpose and a plan for your life. But listen, no matter what you feel like, God loves you. We love you. And, and, and if you learn nothing else from these shepherds, then know this. You see in this, this story the great, unbelievable almost link that God will go to. I mean, our God is a God who will do whatever it takes to reach us and to find us right where we are, just as we are, okay? Now, let me ask you a personal question. Where did God find you? Where did God find you? I know you all have stories. I don't know all of your stories, but I, I know mine. But where were you when God found you? Well, let me tell you about my story just briefly. I mean, I was off wandering down some stupid dead-end path, like some lost, silly little sheep just doing my own thing. Man, I was living for myself. Just live. I mean, my highest agenda was my own temporary personal happiness and pleasure. I thought I knew what was going to make me happy. I thought I knew what I wanted. But let me tell you, I didn't have a clue what I needed. I didn't have a clue. My eyes were so darkened, but thanks be to God, he knew. He knew exactly what I needed, and I'm telling you, God invaded my world. God changed my heart. He forgave all my sins. He showed me mercy when I deserved wrath. He gave me grace when I deserved judgment. He, he cleaned me up from the inside. He opened my eyes and put a new love in my heart for him and other people. And, and just to show off, he made me a pastor. It's like, I'm going to take this guy that nobody thinks they can do anything with. And, and, I'm gonna, and, and I'm telling you, I've never been the same. I've never been the same since that encounter when God found me and I chose from that moment on, to, to, I committed my life, every breath that I have, to declaring his greatness for as long as I live. Amen. And, and, and maybe you can say the same. And I know if we were to go around this room this morning, we would hear story after story after story of people telling how God had broke into their world and found them and changed them. That's what we're talking about this morning, how God finds us. God meets us right where we are. Don't you just love that about our God? It's amazing. And, and notice this in verse 9. When God finds us, when we encounter God, here's the next thing, he'll bring us to our knees. Doesn't sound like a good thing, but it's a really good thing. He'll bring us to our knees. When you encounter God and you really get a glimpse of how awesome and holy and majestic and big he is, doesn't it just humble you when you stop and consider that? Maybe even terrify you a little bit? Um. Maybe awestruck is a better word for it, but that's exactly what happened to the shepherds, however you want to describe it. It says, an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And again, we've heard this story so many times. We're like, why wouldn't you be cheering and jumping up for joy? Why wouldn't you be excited about this? Because we don't get it. We've become numb. It's become too familiar to us. But again, God help us to recapture this. When the glory shines around you, the unfiltered glory of God, let me tell you, you're going to respond just like these shepherds. And it says they were terrified. They were terrified. That was their initial response. Now listen, I'm all for preaching the love of God. I'm all for preaching the, the good news, the grace and the kindness and the compassion and the long-suffering and the patience of our God. It's all there. Let me tell you, make no mistake about it. That is biblical. But I want to encourage you this morning, let's don't focus in our own personal walk with God or us as a church. Let's not focus so much on those traits to the exclusion of the other things that are equally true, that our God is a powerful and a sovereign and a holy and a mighty God. Amen. And let's not forget what the Scriptures declare about our God, that He dwells in unapproachable light. You cannot look upon the, the brilliance and the presence of God directly. It would kill you. And so the response of these shepherds, well, I'm going to tell you, that's a very, very, very appropriate response in the presence of a holy God. And let me tell you, when God finds you, and you experience His glory and His majesty and His holiness. I'm man, I'm just saying, Wow. If that doesn't cause you to drop to your face in adoration and praise and humble humility, then I think something's a little off. Something's a little wrong in our hearts somewhere, but, but that will happen, I believe, when you realize just how big and awesome God is and when you realize who we are and what should have been our future as sinful people and when you realize how frail we are in His presence. It, it says the shepherds were terrified, and I have to say this because I love you. When it comes to eternity, when it comes to eternity, 
If you are not this morning in this place right now, 100%, absolutely certain, I mean like you know that you know that you know that you know where you will spend eternity when you step out of this life into the next. If you're not sure of that, well, I, I think that would be a terrifying place to be for sure. I can't imagine not knowing, not thinking about that. And some of the people that I see every single day who are just willingly knowingly rejecting the only hope that we have for hope beyond this life, if they would just stop for a moment, just a moment, and turn down the noise of this world and stop for a moment and consider the unimaginable horrors of hell, and yet, and yet, the indescribable joys and blessings of heaven, I'm telling you, they would be gripped to the core. They would be gripped to the core, and they would not continue as they're continuing. I'm telling you, eternity is an incredibly sobering reality. It has a way to wake you up, and, 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 and yet so many people are doing the exact opposite. They are doing everything they can to push away the idea of eternity and death and standing before God someday as far away from, they can, from them as they can, and they rush around, and they fill their lives with so many things, and they numb their conscience, and they harden their hearts in so many ways. I'm just telling you this morning, as clear as I know how to be, it's not going to be a great day at the end for a person who does that. I just say that because I love you guys. I love, I love, I love you too much to tell you, not to tell you, the, to tell you the truth. I'm telling you, to keep that from you, let me say. It's not going to be a great end for the person who does that. In fact, it's going to be terrifying. It's a terrifying thing to stand before God unprepared, unprepared. The reason these flowers are up here that aren't necessarily a part of the Christmas set is because we're still remembering and, and in a very well still grieving a, a, a sister who was a vital part of this church, and we had the homegoing for celebration, homegoing, homegoing celebration for just yesterday, Amanda Allen. And I believe her husband's probably here somewhere today, actually. But um, she was ready to go to a dinner party with her husband. She was on her way. She was getting all fixed up, and before the night was over, she was in heaven. But let me tell you something. She was prepared. <laughs> she was prepared. She wasn't terrified at all. She was overjoyed. But, but some people will be terrified. But let me give you the good news of Christmas. Here it is. Right here, it does not have to be that way for anybody. It doesn't have to be that way for you. It could be, in fact, a very joyful thing. It could be good news for you here today on that day. So a good question that you might be asking maybe at this point is, okay, okay, I get it. God's amazing. He's awesome. He's completely other. And when he finds us, encounters us, he's going to bring us to our knees. But, but, Pastor, what happens then? What happens when I'm on my knees? Humbled before the Lord in that way. What happens when our face is in the dirt before the holy God of the universe? I, I mean, is God going to be the kind of person that's going to kind of come and kick us while we're down? Is he going to hang the rap sheet of sin over our, our life and shove it in our face and say, boy, you're in big trouble now. Do you realize what you've done? You better, you start, better start begging for mercy. Is that, is that, no, no, that is not who our God is. That is not who our God is at all. The reason God brings us to our knees at all is so we can recognize our great need of Him. And we can look upon Him and we can reach out to Him and we can receive all the good things, the life and life more abundantly that He desires to give us. Listen, God wants you to hear and receive and experience the good news. He wants that for you, and that's what he does in the life of these shepherds. Look at verse 10 again. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. They were terrified, but now this wonderful word of reassurance, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Isn't that cool? Even though our God is so big and so mighty and so powerful, so much, again, that you cannot look directly into his presence without it killing you. Couldn't be not, you could not be exposed to his glory. It would, it would vaporize you, even though all that's true. Every time, nearly every time in Scripture that you see God bringing someone to their knees, almost entirely, the very next words out of God's mouth are these wonderful words of reassurance. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Listen, God is more powerful than you and I could ever comprehend. And yet he is more loving and he's more compassionate than you and I could ever understand. And he knows who we are. He knows how frail and weak we are. He, as the Bible says, he knows that we are but dust. And, and many times, I, I don't know if you've had this experience, if you could testify to this, but many times in my own life, sometimes I realize that the, the times where God brought me to my knees, he had to do that. He had to stop me in my tracks so I could finally hear I know it was that way for sure initially, so I could finally hear and receive the good news for myself. But listen, 
The wonderful message of Christmas is God wants to get that good news out to every living person on this planet. I, I bring you good news, he says. Don't you think that's something our world desperately needs to hear at the end of 2018 and as we look forward to 2019? We desperately, they desperately need to hear it. And, and, and the impact, again, is great joy. Great joy. Don't, don't miss that. Listen, the people in this world... By the millions, they pay big-time bucks for any little experience of fleeting, momentary, temporary happiness. But let me tell you, they just walk away more hungry than ever. It just leaves them more empty than ever. And what they need to know is they can experience joy unspeakable for all of life and for all eternity with Christ Jesus as their personal Lord, okay? It's good news. What, what's the good news? If somebody was to ask you, hey, what's all the good news about? What are you all raving about down there at J.C. Naz? I hope you have an answer for them. Listen, the good news is that God of heaven came down in the person of Jesus. He came and he took on flesh and he walked among us and he gave his life for us. He did for us what we could never do for ourselves. And he took our place and he the good news is that you don't have to pay the penalty of your sins because it's already been paid for. The good news is you do not have to spend eternity apart from God in hell. But you can go to heaven because Jesus gave his all. He gave the greatest gift that could ever be given. And you can have every sin that you've ever committed forgiven in a moment of faith and cleansed. And you can be empowered to become the person that God has called you to become. That's good news, amen? Amen. What is it? Come on, it's Christmas for crying out loud. Tell me, church, I bring you good news. That's better. Amen, amen. It is good. It's good news. God loves you. Jesus died for you. He's reaching out to you right now. You can repent of your sins and turn away from that empty old life, and you can be forgiven of all your sins, and you can be reconciled to the God of heaven, the God of the universe, and you can become, by His grace, a son or daughter of the Most High. You can be filled with His Spirit and live a victorious life, and you can spend eternity someday with Him forever. Amen? That's good news. Amen? Amen. That's good news. And you're going to love this next part. This is one of my favorite parts. Who's the good news for? It's for all people. That's right. It's for everyone, not just a few shepherds out in the fields near Bethlehem, not just for a certain ethnic culture, not just for, uh, certainly not just for one denomination. It's wide open, man. I'm telling you, it's wide open. It's for every person who would humble themselves, even today, and, and kill their stupid, silly pride that keeps us separated from God and receive Jesus by faith. It's for everyone who would do that. And I am so amazed. I'm so amazed, uh, not just at Christmas time, but regularly throughout the year. I, I'm just so amazed that God's plan for salvation included me. Aren't you? Aren't you just stunned by that? I mean, we deserve hell. We deserve wrath. We, we don't deserve any of that. But, but God's plan included even us. And let me tell you something else. There's not one person that you've ever met or could ever lock eyes with that is so hardened, that is so deep in sin, that is so far gone that they cannot be saved and they cannot become a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, church, when God's word says everyone, he means it. Amen? It's for everyone. Everyone. we got to get the word out. This is good news. And so that's, that's how God finds us. He meets us where we are. He brings us to our knees. He offers us this incredibly good news so that we can experience it in our lives. And when all that's happened, you know for sure this fourth thing is going to happen, right? When we're captured by God's amazing grace and the good news that is for all people, and we're welling up with that joy, listen, here's what we're going to do right here. We're going to respond in radical obedience. We're going to respond in radical obedience. How? First of all, by believing what he said and acting in obedience. Do you, do you want a simple prescription for the Christian life? Whether you do or not, I'm going to give it to you anyway, okay? But, I mean, I'm just saying. Do you, if you want, I mean, just a very, I believe in keeping it simple. And we make it too hard sometimes, this Christian life. It is simple. It, it's not always easy, but it is simple to understand for anybody if you want a simple prescription for the Christian life, here it is right here. One that will put a never-ending song of joy in your heart, cause you to leave here overflowing with eternal hope. Here it is. Do this right here. Two things. Believe what God has said and do what God has said. You say, what else, Pastor? That's it. 
Just believe what God has spoken to you through his word and through his spirit. And he has lots of great ways to get our attention. But believe what he says and do what he says. You just got to believe him. And then you step out in faith, trusting him as you put your faith into actions. The shepherds for sure did that. Verse 15. Verse 15. My, my tablet just went crazy on me. I'm going to find it. It, got, it went back to the bidding. You want to start over? You want to start over? We, 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 we won't do that. No, here it is. Verse 15, when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And then verse 16, I love this. They hurried off. They hurried off. I love these guys. They're like, hey, this angel of God just came to us. Can you believe it? He included us in this amazing plan of salvation. We believe it. Now let's go. I mean, just like, boom, instantaneous. Now, think with me for just a second. Let's have some fun here this Christmas season. Imagine all the dumb things the shepherds could have said at this point. Okay? I mean, just, just do a little. They could have said, I, I, I don't think that was really an angel. I mean, that's not at all what my parents told me angels look like. I don't even think it was an angel. I mean, it was something, some cosmic thing. I don't know. I don't, hey, well, maybe it was an angel, but, uh, you know, I, I don't know. Maybe it was just a bad dream. Maybe, maybe we shouldn't have eaten all that pizza before bed tonight. I mean, that was just kind of messed us up a little bit. Or maybe it was an angel. Maybe it was God's message. But do we have to go right now? I mean, after all, it's the middle of the night, and we got a lot of responsibility here, and we're a little tired, and, and, and it's far too risky to travel at night. Can we just do it tomorrow? Or maybe next week looks a little better. I mean, I'll check my calendar. I mean, think of all. Now, we chuckle at that, and we laugh at that silliness. But I'm telling you, the excuses that we use, hello? The excuses that we use sometimes to rationalize resisting God's will are just as crazy in the light of all that he's revealed to us and the light of all that's in store for us for sure. But listen, if you want to find God and you want to experience God's life in your life, it's very simple. When he speaks, believe him. If he commands, go, because faith is revealed in our actions. Again, I can't get away from that phrase, they hurried off. Another translation says they went in haste. It almost gives you this visual picture that they took off running to Bethlehem. They could have run the entire two miles. I don't know. And they found Mary and Joseph and the ba baby lying in the manger just as they were told. And you have to respect that, don't you? You have to respect that kind of sensitivity in their heart. I mean, they didn't even know God really, but they responded. Let me just ask you a very personal question. How quickly can God get your attention? What's your response time when the Lord speaks to you? I mean, these shepherds are just out there doing their thing. Man, they didn't expect this. In a million years, they would not have expected this. And just another night, just working, just taking care of business. And then, boom, all of a sudden, God shows up out of nowhere. He speaks to them. They encounter his glory. And, 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 and everything from that moment on changed for them and many around them, too. Listen, they believed and they responded. Let me ask you, what's your response time to God? How quickly can God turn you around? you got your own agenda. You're, you got plans. I get that. But if God speaks to you, listen, as a Christ follower myself, I want my response time to be about as quick as this, as quick as I can say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. As quick as I can get that out of my mouth. That's how quickly I want to allow them to move my feet and go in a different direction if it would please him. So what's your attitude towards that? And then perhaps one of the most powerful things that happens when God finds us and when you find God, when God reveals something life-changing. When God gives you the gift of something that's of eternal value, here's what happens. You can't help but share it with others. You can't help but share it with others, right? Let me read these next verses. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them. They spread the word about this child. Christian, can I ask you a very serious question? Take this to heart. Who have you, if you know Christ this morning, let me, I'm asking you, who have you told about Jesus so far this Christmas season? Who have you? Listen, you don't have to tell people about necessarily, you don't have to figure out all the right words to say about how to tell someone what God can do for them. All you have to do is tell them what God's done for you, amen? Who have you told about Jesus? Yeah, let me ask it another way. Is there going to be anybody that's going to experience God and have their lives changed through the ministry of this church this year, they're going to show up to one of these services this Christmas season because they, you invited them. Is there going to be anybody that shows up because you personally reach out to a neighbor, a friend, a coworker, 
some random person that God set up a divine appointment. Let me give you some help with that. We have specific personalized cards just for this season, just for this series. It says, on the way to the manger, I know you can't see this one, but they're out there. We got thousands of them. Take, take 10 or 20 and just have them in your wallet or your purse or have them in your car. Have them ready at work. I'm telling you, God will give you opportunities. God, help me to be a light. Help me to spread the word concerning you. Help someone's life to be changed because of mine and the Lord in me this Christmas. You can take these cards. It has all of our information on the back. You can just hand it to someone and say, we would love to have you join us this Sunday, next Sunday, whatever it is. You don't have to sit there and explain all the details, 10 minutes of talking. You just give them this card. They can look it up. It's all on there. But I encourage you to take these. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning all that had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. I mean, you just couldn't shut these guys up, right, once they found Christ. Verse 20, the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, which was just as they had been told. Listen, the shepherds for sure had an encounter with Christ. And because they had an encounter with Christ, they had a story. And man, did they ever tell their story. And let me tell you something, if you've discovered Jesus, if you've you know the joy of his forgiveness and the joy of eternal life. You have a story. Yes, you do. You have a story. And your story is worth telling. And your story could be used powerfully by, by God to change someone's life now and for all eternity. So let me ask you, do you have a story? Do you have a story? If you have a story, I can tell you right now with complete certainty what God expects of you. He expects you when you leave this building to be praying and looking and, and prepared for opportunities that he will give you to share the story, to point people to Jesus. If you don't have a story, though, this is so exciting to me. If you don't have a story, that could change for you right now. Before you leave here, you could start. God could write a new story in your life. Amen? He could start you and make you a brand new creation and put you on a completely brand new path. You can't even imagine until you step across the line of faith. I'm going to ask that you stand with me this morning, and I'm going to invite some musicians to come back up. And If you're able to stand, if you're not able to stand, feel free to stay seated. That is perfectly fine. But I want you to stand, and, and we're, we stand not just to get you ready to go, but we stand to, sometimes it helps our posture to give our full attention to God. And so you're kind of standing at a ready. And maybe even in your heart right now, you're saying, God, I I want to receive all that you have for me this Christmas. So I'm going to invite you to go ahead and bow your heads. And I want to talk to you very personally. I ask you to bow your heads. We're not going to do anything up here. I just don't want you to be distracted. I, I want you to hear God's voice right now. And so maybe as you're standing there this morning, as you're being honest, if you're completely honest, you're not completely sure about your readiness to meet God. If you're just being blunt honest, if you were to die today, you were standing before God. You're not completely sure if you're no Christ. If you're being honest, you're not completely sure if you would spend eternity with him in heaven. But the good news is you can be sure right now. And you, I'm going to tell you, you can live with that assurance from here on out until he calls you home. But I want to ask you a couple questions this morning, okay? The Bible says in Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So I just want to ask you a few simple questions. You answer this quietly in your own heart. Do you, do you, it does not matter what I believe. It does not matter what this church believes. It does not matter what the people on stage believe. It does not matter what your mom or dad or your grandma or grandpa believe. This is what you believe. That's all that matters for time and for all eternity. So here's the question I want to ask you. Do you believe that Jesus is, is God's one and only Son. Do you believe the truth of the Christmas story? In other words, do you believe that Jesus really did come into this earth as God in the flesh and He really did live and He really did die on the cross so that you could be fully forgiven and cleansed of all your sins? Just, just ask that question for yourself. Just honestly answer it in your own heart. Do I believe that? Do you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross? He was really dead. Do you believe he was buried? And do you believe that through his death, he conquered death and the curse of sin forever? And that apart from his sacrifice, do you believe we have no hope 
Not for you, not for me, not for anyone. Do you believe that Jesus Christ alone is the way and the truth and the life and that none of us are able to come to the Father but by Him? Do you believe this? Acts 2.21 says, everyone, everyone, remember this is good news for all people, everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. And I'm telling you, my friend right now, you are not here on accident. Your heart's pounding right now if God's talking to you. You're stopped in your tracks to hear this life-giving message, you could make that choice right now. You could make that personal decision right now before you leave here, and you could become a brand new person in Jesus Christ. You could just pray this prayer from your heart right now. In fact, why don't we do something we haven't done for a little while? I'm going to have everybody pray it, okay? Because our intention is not to single anybody out and put anybody on the spot and embarrass you and all that. We, we just we're just here to point people to Christ, okay? And so whether you've prayed this prayer many, many years ago, you're walking strong with the Lord today, I just want everybody, for the help of that friend here today who's maybe a little timid, says, I, I don't want to be the only one talking. Let's, let's all pray it together, okay? And this is a prayer of faith that you could pray to God and reach out to Him, just saying, God, I need you, and I want the gift that you give, and I believe it today. And so you could pray something like this, every head bowed, every eye closed. God, I know that I have sinned. Pray that out loud. God, I know that I have sinned. And I have grieved your Holy Spirit. But I believe in you. And I receive you. Come into my life today. And change me from the inside out. Forgive all of my sins. Make me the man or the woman that you call me to be. I'm tired of living for myself. Today, here and now, I turn from my old life. Amen. And I turn towards the life that you offer. And with your help and with your strength, I will love you. And I will follow you. And I will serve you all the days of my life. From this day forward, I give myself to you and to your kingdom in the mighty, matchless, wonderful name of Jesus, my Savior. Amen. Amen. We celebrate new life.